to live the life that we should live that we have not and we fail to do, to die the death that we deserve in our place as our sacrifice, so that we might be given the righteousness of Christ through faith and that our sins might be forgiven and atoned for and that we might be reconciled with you. And he rose again on the third day. And so now we live in this already not yet tension. We, we look at the arrival of Jesus who has already come, and yet we look forward in anticipation for the day in which he will return. So God, help us to reflect upon who Jesus is and the joy that we find in the good news of our salvation that is found in Christ. And praise you. We love you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you this morning to stand uh, and to sing, and we will be singing who will come. All you faithful this morning.
1 John chapter 1. Uh, if you want to follow along in the few Bibles that are there in front of you, you can find that on page 1266. And as you're finding your way there, I try to say this each week, but I'd like to remind you, if you need a Bible or you know someone that needs a Bible, that's our gift to you. We'd love for you to take that and use it or share that with someone who needs one. So please do so if that applies to you. So 1 John chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4 this morning. So 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard and which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life. That which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you want to pray with me, and we're going to look at that passage together. God, we thank you. Uh, for this beautiful day that you created, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. And we thank you for this season when we stop and, and just contemplate the glory of you, the eternal God, coming to us. And so we pray this morning as we read in First John, as we look at your word and what you've revealed to us and what you've shown to us about who you are and what you've done for us and what it means, that we would see it afresh today, that we would be overwhelmed with the glory of your great grace and love for us, that we would leave here excited about this season and about who we are in you and sharing that with others and loving others as you have loved us. And so we just pray that as we spend time in your word today that you would be the one that teaches and leads and guides us in all truth. We thank you for this opportunity to be together in your name. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, you know, growing up, I guess still now, uh, I've always liked uh, movies a lot. And when I say I like movies, I mean, I think a lot of us probably say like movies. Uh, but in high school, I, I thought I wanted to go to film school. And I, uh, I just always was interested in how they made movies and different things about it. And uh, when I got to college, I ended up going and doing architecture, but I took several film classes just because I enjoyed it. And, and the reason really was like, uh, thinking about it and thinking back on it even this week was this idea of just that really great movies uh, kind of change your thinking or they change your perspective or maybe they stick with you for a while and they really make you kind of turn things over and, and so there's a whole lot of movies that don't fall in that category but when you come across one that's really good that really kind of sticks with you for a while and, and I was thinking about that why that's the case and why it's like that and, and the great ones that do that I think touch on uh, just some universal themes some things that touch on or, or, or uh, relate to all of us in different ways. And so I was thinking about that this week, like just, you know, the, the see all the time, movies that are good versus evil. And we see that all around us. And so we, we love movies like that where, where good triumphs over evil. We love movies where uh, justice is, is um, served. Some great injustice is done, and then throughout the movie, the protagonist gets things together, and then we see justice at the end, it's like we want to stand up and cheer for it. Or, or we love or we're drawn to movies uh, that are love stories. So many gravitate towards movies that are that are the traditional romance or the love story. I, I still vividly remember being in uh, college at, uh, at, at A&M. And when I was a freshman, uh, they used to do this thing where they'd have free showings of movies on campus. It was right in the middle of the student center. And you could go get free tickets. You'd be walking through the student center and they'd say, today we're showing whatever new movie and you can come check it out. And so I remember going to a movie with one of my roommates uh, that was free. So if college student, anything free, you're like, yes, I'm in, I'm in. And so I remember going to see the movie uh, Jerry Maguire. And if you've ever seen Jerry Maguire, it's, it's a, a movie about a sports agent that's trying to do the right thing. But it's really kind of a love story. It's about a typical, it's Tom Cruise movie. And Tom Cruise is the, you know, the hero and it's really about him and this relationship with this girl. And I remember going into this movie with my roommate when we walk in, and it's like 80% female there. Right? It's us and a bunch of young ladies watching this movie. And, and what I remember about it, and it's not that it's the greatest movie or anything, but there's a scene at the end of the movie where Tom Cruise is trying to win the girl back. And he goes into, 
into her house, and he's pouring out his heart to her. It's kind of like, I don't want to live my life without you. And then he says, and, and you complete me. And I still remember in the theater, all the ladies, oh, you know, like gushing over this thing where Tom Cruise says to this girl, you complete me. And there's that part of those kind of movies, those, those love stories, like that idea of looking for the soulmate, the one that completes you. And so we're drawn to that. And people love those kind of movies, and oftentimes they get uh, the most popular ones. Are, are the same is true with uh, movies that deal poignantly with death and how we face it. Because we've all had to deal with that at different times in our life, or we will. And so we've, we've got those kind of themes that run through. And there's several big ones that you see in movies. Or, or maybe the, uh, the home lost and home regained, if you've ever heard that before. The idea that you see so many movies where somebody goes out and they lose a lot. And then the rest of the movie they're trying to get back. And at the end they kind of come home. Uh, I don't want to ruin it for you, but almost every Disney movie is like that. <laughs> right? That's the same formula. But the reason is, in all these that they resonate with us, is all of these themes are, are based in truth. There's a deep truth that resonates with us in these different, I'm not saying the movies are necessarily true, but the themes that are underneath it, that draws us in, that we care about, are true. And so as we continue in Advent, and as Andy said just a minute ago, Advent means arrival, the coming of Jesus, that he's here now. And we contemplate what we celebrate at Christmas. I just want to remind you that the Christmas story, what God has done for us in Jesus, touches on all these things. And it's not a fairy tale. And it's not something we made up. But it's the truth of who we are and how we're made and what God wants for us. And so as we think about those things this morning, we're going to do that by looking at a passage in 1 John chapter 1 that I just read to you. And 1 John is a letter that the Apostle John writes and he's encouraging the church, and he's telling us some profound things. And he's going to say here that the God who has always existed, that eternally existed, this creator of all things, has come to us. And has been made manifest. And he's done so, and in doing so, the greatest joy is available to us. And I want us just to stop and kind of make that together this morning. So if we look at those four verses, this is the way I want us to think about it. First, there's a glorious truth here in this passage that we need to contemplate that we really need to stop and think about. And it's foundational for our belief and our confession of faith as Christians and what we believe in, but it's so important that we need to stop and contemplate it. Secondly, I want us to think about how Jesus connects us to this truth, and then lastly, the joy that comes when we understand this. Right? So this glorious truth, how Jesus connects us, and the joy that comes when we do it. So let's just start with the glorious truth that's presented here. And so look again at verses 1 and 2. It says, That which was... From the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father has, was, and was made manifest to us. And I want us to focus in on the end of verse 2 there, where he says, the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. And, and John's talking about here Jesus and, and him coming and us seeing him and being there and touching and seeing and, and listening and being part of it. So remember, John's one of the apostles that lived with Jesus in his earthly ministry and he was there, eyewitness to these things. And he says, I want you to, to stop and think about this. And what John says here is very similar to what he says in his gospel. So John chapter 1, not 1 John, but John's gospel, John chapter 1, he says something very similar, very similar conception. And in John 1 and verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so he's again talking about Jesus. He'll say later in verse 14 of John chapter 1, and then he came and dwelt among us, talking about Jesus. And so he says something very similar in both of these, and he starts this way. Now, if you go to, the, to later on in John's Gospel, in, in the Gospel of John, he'll start to flesh out more fully this relationship of the Father and the Son, and then he'll start to talk about the Holy Spirit. And what he's doing and what we see here, what we see just kind of uh, in the background, so to speak, in 1 John 1, is this idea of the Trinitarian God that we worship. We just sang it. Praise the Father, praise the Son, 
Praise the Holy Spirit, three and one. Right? We're just singing that. That's a confession of our faith. That this is who we believe God is. And I want us to really stop and think about this for just a second. We get to this idea of the Trinity, and it can be a difficult idea. Just put that out there. It is. It's hard for us to hold fully. But what the Bible teaches us is, is this, that God exists in three persons. And that each person is fully God, but there is one God. And if we stick to that conception, that's what the Bible teaches. And it kind of keeps us away from heresy. As soon as we start to try to explain it better, we start to go, well, there's an analogy that's like this. Oftentimes we kind of get off into the weeds real quickly. But what the Bible does teach us is that God exists in three persons. And each person is fully God, but there is one God. And I want us to think about that for just a second. How that works and, and, and what that, how that plays into what John is saying here in 1 John 1 that's so important. And so uh, I'll just say this as, as a caveat as we think about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Michael Horton wrote a book on systematic theology. And Horton's a brilliant theologian, and he says right in the beginning in his introduction, he says, when you start to undertake trying to understand God, be careful because you can go insane. And his point is, and what he says is, God is infinite and we are finite. And when we start to plumb the depths of who God is, we're quickly going to get in over our heads. Now, that doesn't mean we don't try to understand God in the way he's revealed himself. Because he has revealed himself to us. And there's things he's told us about. But when we get to the Trinity, suddenly it becomes, it starts to go past our ability in some ways. But I do want us to think about a couple things as it pertains to the Trinity and what it means with what John is saying to us about having this fellowship with God. Having great joy in our lives. And understanding that really will help us in that. And so when I think about the Trinity, it helps me greatly uh, to go to C.S. Lewis. If you know who C.S. Lewis is, he was an author. He was a professor of literature. He's a brilliant man. Uh, he became a Christian later in his life. He wrote uh, Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote a whole bunch of books after that. And he became a great apologist for the Christian faith. And one of the reasons he was such a great apologist is his incredible intellect. He brought all this to bear on his love for God and explaining that and thinking about it. And so C.S. Lewis has helped me greatly in my life, particularly as it pertains to the Trinity. And so listen carefully to what C.S. Lewis says about the love that exists within God himself. He says, many seem not to notice that the words God is love have no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. The loving, dynamic activity of love has been going on in God forever. And so I want you to think about that for just a second. What Lewis says, that in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is this perfect love and joy that has always eternally existed. And if we miss the part, what the Bible tells us, that God is three, and that all are, are equally and fully God, but there is one God. We miss that conception. We miss that love has always existed in God. That it's always been. And so listen to the next part of what he says. God is a dynamic, pulsating activity. A life. Almost a kind of drama. Almost, if you will not think of me irreverent, a kind of dance. The union between the Father and Son is such a live, concrete thing that this union itself is a person. So here what he says, Father and Son and the union that connects them is a person, the Holy Spirit. Jonathan Edwards would talk about God in this way. That as the Father emanates what the Son is like, it's the Holy Spirit that's bringing the two together. And that goes with what Jesus says in John's Gospel. If you read all the passages where he talks about the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And so it's this incredible picture, and Lewis kind of helps us think through that. I admit, I hate to read C.S. Lewis to you, but I do have a couple of quotes here. And the reason I hate to read C.S. Lewis to you is often you've got to read it over and over a few times and really think about it. And so I want us to think deeply together about the, the Trinity, the triune God, the Godhead, uh, the heart of what we believe as Christians because it is so important. And here's why. In and of himself, love and joy is eternally existing. And so when God creates, he doesn't create out of need. He doesn't create so that he can then experience love or joy. He already has them and has them fully. He creates to share with us the love and joy that has always existed in the God. 
And so when we really stop and think about what that means and why that's so important, it's not because of any deficiency in him that he created to share his love with us. And so God loves because he loves. He shares his love with us because he has love and he wants to share it with us, not because he needs anything. And that's an important point when we start to think about our relationship with God and what it looks like. But also what John is going to say here, and that I'm telling you this, that God has come to us in Jesus so that your joy may be full. And he's showing us this and he's saying at the ends of this is joy. So think about this for just a second. If God is love and perfect joy in and of himself, and he is the fount of it, he is the author of it, it begins and ends with him, we only ever experience him because he created us out of that. The only way that we will ever connect, that we will ever have the fullness of that love and joy is by connecting to our Heavenly Father, in which it emanates from. And so, listen again to the way C.S. Lewis says, You want to be warm, you must stand near a fire. If you want to be wet, you must get in water. If you want joy and power and peace and eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They are a great fountain of energy spurting up out the very center of reality. And if you are close to it, the spray will wet you. And if you are not, you will remain dry. Once a man is united to God, how could he not live forever? And once separated from God, what can he do but wither and die? And so what Lewis is saying is the only way that we will ever find the joy that we created for is in God himself. So, all that to say, why do we have all these longings? Right? The one that will complete me. The, the returning home. Injustice. Good versus evil. Why are all those themes so palatable to all of us? And the answer is, because we've blown it. Because we've turned our back on the very source of joy and love and logic that started it all. That's what sin is. We've chosen to ignore God in the world that he created. We've chosen to go and look for ultimate joy and purpose and love and meaning and things other than the source. And when we do that, we will continue to seek and try to find it and we'll never be able to be filled. Right? As Blaise Pascal says, we all have a God-shaped hole that only the very fount of all these things could ever fill. And as soon as we seek to find them somewhere else, we will never, ever find them. And so the heart of sin is that our union has been broken with God. We've turned our backs on Him. We've turned our back on the one that can only, the only one that can ever give us that great joy. We've chosen to define ourselves by what we do and who we are rather than who God is and what he's done. And so we long for home. And we long for love and acceptance. And we long for justice. And we struggle against death. Because all of these things have come because of our union with God. It's been broken by our sin. And so when we stop and think about this, and this is what I want us to focus on, Christmas reminds us that in light of that brokenness, in light of our turning on our backs on God, God still loves us and pursues us and has come to us to set things right. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas, and that's what John is talking about here. And so the second thing, how does Jesus connect us back to this love and this joy and this logic and this spout that we were created for? And he says, if you look at the, the second half of verse 2, he says, We testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That what we've seen, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus has come. He's laid aside everything that he deserves to bring us back home. To bring us back to, to the thing that we're yearning and desiring. And what John says is, is that we've seen this. We've seen the glory of God come down and we saw him. And we touched him. And we walked with him. And we're now proclaiming to you the glory of what he's done and who he is. I can't help but think that when John says that when we've touched him, I can't prove this. This is just my, my musing on it as I think about it. But when we touched him... That I can't help but think he's thinking of when Jesus says to Thomas, touch my hands and see after the resurrection. And he says, we touched, we, we saw it. 
they will touch them. And we saw him gloriously raised again from the dead. And so I want you to really think about what John uh, is saying here. The glory of what he's talking about. That the eternal word of life, the eternal God that created all things, has now come to us. And we say that, we say that at Christmas, and we say it every week here, we come back to it. And, and the sad truth is oftentimes we can kind of get ho hum to that as Christians. This incredible idea. It's at the very heart of Christmas. We kind of get used to it. And like, how, does, how can that happen? How can that be like that? Ah, it's pretty cool. God can, you know, and just move on. And I was thinking of it like this this week. Joanne and I got a few years ago to go to the Grand Canyon. I don't know if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon. Um, we went, I guess it's been about five years ago. And we got to go to the Grand Canyon. And we flew into Phoenix and we were there for a couple days and then we drove up. And so we went to the south road through Arizona to the Grand Canyon. And I remember being so excited to see it. I can't wait to get there. And we went and we checked into the place where we were staying and we parked our car and then you could walk from where we were. But everywhere around, it's just kind of normal, whatever. And then you walk up, and the trees kind of part, and there it is. And it's like, oh, it's incredible. Y your mind can't get around how big it is. It's hard to even fathom the scale as you stand there and look at it. And we're just blown away at the beauty of God's creation and seeing it in front of you. But this is the thought I was thinking this week. What if you could build a house right on the, the rim? Right? Like what, if, what if you could get up every day? And open your back door and go out on your back deck and just, there's the grand canyon. That's your backyard. How long would it take before you go, ah, it's just the grand canyon? Would it take a month or, or six months or a year or two? When would it be that you walk out there and go, ah, it's okay. Yeah, I've seen that before. But that's what we do. That's what we do with God's word. When it says, the eternal life which was with the Father, was made manifest to us. And we've seen it, and we heard it, and we proclaim it to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. He says, He's come to us that we can be brought back in. That we can have the joy and the relationship that we were created for. Jesus has come to do for us what we can never do for ourselves. He's entered into space and time, into his very creation. C.S. Lewis would say it's like the author has written himself into the story. And now he's here. The eternal word of life. And John says, we saw him and we touched him and we're proclaiming to you what he did. And what he did is he came and he lived the perfect life. He loved God and he loved man perfectly and fully in everything he did. He came to the end of his life. And he deserves all the blessings that go with honoring God and everything perfectly and fully, and yet he chooses to lay his life down for us. He takes our sin upon himself, and he pays for it as he goes to the cross, and then he's gloriously raised again, and he does all of this that we can be brought back into this fellowship that we were created for. This joy, the fount of joy himself comes and humbles himself to the point of even death so that we can be brought back in. What do you think about what a glorious truth that is? What do you think about when John says we're proclaiming to you what we have seen and we have touched and we have heard? John and the apostles would travel the world, giving their lives to tell anyone and everyone that would listen. They would go through great horrors and be tortured and killed and all sorts of things just so they could tell people. Like, this is what we've seen? If you struggle with that, uh, I think that's one of the great apologetics of the way they went and spread the gospel and the way we've seen it, seen it take hold. But I'll just say to you, year after year, people say, well, religion is dying out, and that's an old fairy tale, and it's regressive, and it's whatever. And every single generation, people are changed by the power of Jesus Christ and what he's done. And it's not gone anywhere. And it continues to be true. And it's the deepest truth of our hearts. And John says, we saw it. And we were there. And Jesus has come. And he's, he's come to bring us back. That indeed our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And you too may have fellowship with us. And he says, so I'm telling you this. That you can have the greatest joy that's ever been available. And so as Jesus comes in the incarnation, he offers us this relationship with God that we were created for. 
the deepest longings of our heart, the things that we make movies about and write songs about and struggle to get our arms around, right? the, the one that completes you, the very thing that you're looking for and everything is now available because of what Jesus has done. And that's what John's telling us here. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. And so he says, indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're telling you that you may have this too. And so again, listen to the way C.S. Lewis says this. He says, the whole dance or drama or pattern of this three personal life is being played out in each one of us. Or putting it in the other way around, each one of us has got to enter that pattern to take his place in that dance. There is no other way to happiness for which we were made. He says it's the only way. It's the only way that you will ever have the fullness of joy is by connecting to the actual source of that joy. And so the last thing I want us to consider as we, we end here is this. Verse 4, that's what he says. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. He's saying we want you to know who Jesus is and what he's done. We want you to be brought back into this fellowship with us that we have with the Father and the Son. And we're doing so that our joy would be complete. That the completeness of joy that we're looking for is only ever going to be found in Jesus. And so there's this great truth, this eternal truth that God has always existed and he is love and joy and is perfect in every way. That we had that when we lost it by turning our back on him, but Jesus loved us so much he's come to us to bring us back in. And that is where joy will be found. That's the only place. And so I want us just to think about that this morning as we celebrate Christmas, as we're in this season of Advent, as we've been talking about fasting for Advent and, and setting aside different things so that we would see more clearly who God is, do you understand why we say that? Because what God's Word says is that everything you're looking for will only ever be found in Jesus. And so telling you, set aside these other things, take time to stop and think about this season in the light of drawing near to Jesus to what God has done for us. Draw near to the Father through the Son, what He's done. The Spirit comes in and reminds us of what is true. What happens oftentimes in the holidays, what happens oftentimes in Christmas, is we decide that everything will be great if this get-together happens. Everything will be great if I get this gift. Everything will be great if things are good with my kids. Everything will be great if whatever. And the truth is, everything will be great when we see and savor Jesus above all else. Because he, and only he, is where we're going to find the deepest joy that we were created for. He's the only one that can complete you. He's the only one that ends evil and suffering. He's the only one that can do away with injustice. He's the only one that brings it all together. And it's only found in and so I just encourage you this Christmas and these few weeks leading up to spend time, to set aside all the trappings that we normally get caught up in and seek his face. And we've talked about fasting, removing something, food, your phone, your television, whatever it is. And then when you want to go back to that thing, to be reminded that Jesus is the only thing that will ever complete the yearnings you have. I'll end here this, I would encourage you to continue to seek him, but I would just remind you of this as well. If you know Jesus, <clears throat> you know what he has done, and you recognize that the greatest joy will only ever be found in him, that it's only what he's done for us by grace, through faith, that he's come to us, I just want to remind you that everyone that you come into contact with, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, the people that are around you, the people that cling to the movie. Oh, what a great story. That's what I want. You have the answer of why they're doing that. You have the truth of the things that they're clinging to and looking for. Every single person that you meet was created in God's image. And every single person you meet desperately needs the love of Jesus in their life. They desperately need to know that the only joy Full joy they are looking for will be found in having fellowship with the Father and His Son. And so we proclaim to you that joy is available. 
And so you have opportunities this Christmas with your friends and your families and your co-workers to tell them that. You have the greatest gift ever at your fingertips. And it's what every single person you see is looking for. And so I just encourage you, as you seek the Lord, as you're asking Him to be overwhelming with His glory, that you would ask Him to show you who you're going to share with Him. We are created to love God and to love others. And I'm convinced that your greatest joy, your greatest Christmas will be found in seeking Him and loving others and pointing to who Jesus is. So, let's pray. God, we thank you for the glorious good news we thank you that you love us so much that you've come to us to do for us what we can never do for ourselves. I thank you for the truth that you are the center of all love and all joy. There will never be found in anything else. And so remind us of that this Christmas. I pray that we would be more excited about that truth than anything else. I pray that you give us opportunities to love others and point them to that, remind them Remind our families and our loved ones that the greatest joy that will ever be is found only in you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. As Andy mentioned, we've got these cups in there in front of you so we can take it in our seats together. You don't have to get up, but I just want to set that up for you for a second. You know, when we come to the table to be reminded, we're being reminded of what Jesus has done, what it costs him to invite us back in. Invite us back in as C.S. Lewis says to the dance that we are created for, the joy that we were made to experience, the love that can only be found in what God has done for us. And so Jesus, on the night before he would lay his life willingly down on the cross, he meets with his disciples and he tells them to continue to do this meal in remembrance of him. So the scriptures recorded this way. When the hour had come, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it and he gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so Jesus tells us, be reminded of what he's done for us. And I can't help but think when Jesus says, continue to do this until I come again. And, 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 and in his first coming, he sets this up and he says, to do it until my second coming when we enjoy this together in the great wedding feast of the Lamb. And he tells us to do this. And I can't help but think he's reminding us that our only joy will ever be found in him. And so we're reminded as we come together that it's all what Jesus has take this bread for reminded that this is Jesus' body given for you. And we take the juice for reminded that this is Jesus' blood given for you. Stand with us.
celebrate the Advent that it's so easily gets lost in all the things that surround the Christmas season. We talk about this every year, and yet our hearts are so fickle. So God, we pray and ask that by your Spirit that you would continually woo us back to behold Christ. That we might see Him. That we not only know in our minds, but that we would believe in our hearts that He is the source of our joy and our happiness. That He is the essence of love manifested to us that we might know your love. And that through knowing that love that we might express and display that love and speak of that love to others. That they may also know. That they may not only come into fellowship with us, but that the fellowship with us would be the fellowship with you. And Father, that's what we pray. And that's what we ask. And that's what we seek. And so God, we ask that you might do that for us in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated for just a minute. Uh, just a couple of uh, final announcements before we uh, depart this morning. I uh, just want to encourage you to join us again next Sunday. Uh, again, if you are a guest here, thank you for coming. Uh, but we'd love for you to come back next Sunday, all of you as well, by friends and family. Uh, it is a great season uh, to be gathered together as God's people. And so we want to encourage you to come back again next Sunday to continue celebrating Advent. I uh, also want to encourage you or remind you about our coded newsletter. It goes out, um, uh, e-news goes out every week. If you have not signed up for it, uh, please do so. It kind of helps to keep you informed as to what is going on with the church, uh, the church body. Uh, so we want to encourage you uh, to do that uh, and uh, just get in touch with Luke, get in touch with somebody here at the church. We'd love to get you involved or hooked up with the uh, coded newsletter. Um, also, want to remind you, uh, JP mentioned it a few minutes ago, uh, with this season about uh, fasting, there are some, along with uh, Advent devotionals, you can see them out at the welcome table. If you'll go out there, uh, you'll see a little book uh, written by John Piper, uh, has some uh, devotions uh, as it relates to the Advent uh, season, so we we'll encourage you to pick one of those up, it's free. There's also a document there about fasting, what it is, uh, and just want to encourage you uh, to uh, uh, just to practice that this season as well as the Lord might lead. So there's some helpful information back there on the table, so please pick that up. Uh, the Christmas poinsettias, or poinsettias, however you say that, um, I never know. Uh, if you would like, uh, from, from what we do here at Coda every year, we do that, and it's a way of remembering uh, those, uh, someone uh, that, we, that we love, maybe someone who's passed on, or uh, just somebody that we would like uh, to have a flower point set in remembrance of them. So I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, you can also stop by the Welcome Center. There is a uh, uh, area that you can fill out. Uh, you can place there uh, who it is a dedication for. Uh, with that, uh, also it's $15. So if you, uh, you can do that by cash or by check. Uh, and then the dedication will be printed out on a handout the Sunday before Christmas. Uh, and at the Christmas Eve gathering. And so we want to encourage you uh, in that way as well. And uh, noting the Christmas Eve service, we will be having a Christmas Eve service at 5 p.m. And as you can imagine, that will be on Christmas Eve. So if you don't already have plans, we'd love to see you here uh, with us uh, on Christmas Eve service. So let me, uh, let me read the benediction. Can you stand with me uh, for the reading of the benediction? I'm going to read from... 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, um, Paul writes here, he says, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Now may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the, fest and to the steadfastness of Christ. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.